Steve, it's uh, such an uh, uh, amazing opportunity to have you here on the podcast to kick it off as well to learn from you. You're one of the most inspiring people in this space, very experienced. You started various companies. You're a business angel. You teach at Berkeley, at Stanford, at Columbia. You're the father of the whole lean startup approach. I think you really have really big impact on the startup world. But um, for this Making It Real podcast, I'm super excited to hear how did you actually get started in the entrepreneurship world? <laughs> <laughs> well, only because I was unemployable in any other profession. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess my career started uh, when I dropped out of college or maybe even earlier uh, when I grew up in a very crazy household. Um, it, it was uh, it was pretty crazy. Um, and... Uh, I went to school and college because that's what I was told I was supposed to do, not because I was interested and very quickly dropped out and uh, joined what the U.S. What did you study? Sorry? I, I was going to be, of all things, a pre-med. Uh, I wanted to be, you know, all, everybody was supposed to be either a doctor or an accountant. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that's what my mother said I was supposed to do. And, and, and while I love science, um, I just had to, no ability to, to study uh, at all. Um, in fact, uh, I never did any homework my entire life in school <laughs> until then. Um, and so had no study habits, had no interest in whatever. And um, I had a girlfriend my first year in college uh, who eventually became uh, my wife who said, you know, why are you here? Some of us actually are working hard to stay in college. You don't seem to want to be here. Why don't you go? And that was the first time in my life, in very young life at the time, I think I was 17, um, when I realized I was no longer my parents' child, that I was now, you know, master of my own fate. And some of us learned that early and some of us learned that later in life. But for me, that was when the light bulb went off that said, no reason for me to be here. I didn't know what anything else was out there, but it, I, I actually started that day Something that I still practice is, is I stuck out my thumb and and basically saw where the world would take me rather than waiting around and waiting for the world to come to me. I just went out and <laughs> decided to see what the world had. And so I hitchhiked down to Miami in Florida in the United States and started working in airports on airplanes and uh, then realized the only place I was actually going to get to learn about airplanes was in the U.S. Air Force. And um, but there was a war on in, in Vietnam at the time. And, but that also sounded exciting <laughs> for some stupid 17 year old. So, so I spent four years in the U S military in Vietnam, a year and a half in Southeast Asia, um, at the variety of military bases. And I actually learned a skill, which was electronics. Um, so, uh, I, I don't even remember what your question was. But that's how. Like how you got into the entrepreneurship world. So I can definitely see the young Steve exploring the world and then trying to find, Hey, where's the exciting place in life for me? Yeah. You know, so, uh, so, so actually to answer your question, what I learned in a, in, in a war zone was that I actually had two skills, which are the only two skills I think I still have, which was, in the middle of chaos, I operated well. So I guess maybe three skills. In the middle of chaos, I operated well. Um, uh, number two is I was able to assimilate a, a large amount of data much faster than most people. Um, and then three is I was able to recognize patterns in that data, again, quicker than most people. You know, it wasn't like a spectacular skill, but it was a pretty unique skill. And in a war zone that got recognized, and. At a very early age, I was given a lot of responsibility to, to maintain electronic equipment in a, in, a, in a place and time that it was pretty important to do so. Um, and those three skills, operating in chaos, assimilating lots of data, and recognizing patterns are actually you know, great skills for entrepreneurs. Um, and, and so to answer your specific question, that's the first time the light bulb went on, though I could never articulate it like that until maybe a couple decades later. But but I did recognize that I loved that environment, chaos, lots of data, lots of new things, and then trying to figure out what are patterns that could come out of those. And and uh, eventually I found my way to Silicon Valley in one of the early boom times when it was actually Silicon Valley when we were making chips. 
and joined the first of my first two semiconductor companies, chip companies that made micro things called microprocessors. And I was there very early on uh, and uh, in the beginning of that and, uh, and then did eight startups in 21 years. Um, and, and so before I, before I started writing about entrepreneurship and teaching entrepreneur, thinking about it, I, I had plenty of practice as a, as a practitioner. Um, from the very early hands-on, you know, lowest level jobs all the way up to CEO. And unlike a lot of my students who have the, have the luxury or benefit of, uh, you know, going through business school and, and or engineering school and, and learning this uh, uh, as lessons or classes, um, I learned them from first principles of ha having to do them. Um, so that's the answer of, I, I think, uh, about my entrepreneurial <laughs> career, um, which really helped, obviously, when I started thinking about the nature of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, you know, the beginning of Lean didn't just come out of thin air. It, it came out of me finally retiring when I was 45 after doing 21 years of this stuff, and then finally get, having time to think about the nature of innovation and entrepreneurship, you know, for your listeners who are practitioners, that is entrepreneurs or investors or whatever, when you're doing your job, your company or your industry, if you're good at it, your head is down, meaning you're focused on a fairly narrow foresight, meaning you might know about competitors, you might be experts in your industry, but if you're thinking great thoughts about, you know, like the nature of innovation and entrepreneurship, you're going to be out of business <laughs> because, you know, your job demands 120% of your time. Um, and so that was the first time on retiring that I got to reflect about what is it we were doing and, and why we were doing it. And that's when the light bulb started going off that maybe we weren't doing the right thing. And you know, you, your background there, you spanned all kinds of, as well, technically industries from hardwares and chips. And then as well, you started gaming companies, right? Which are more like software and like, as well, you could argue very competitive uh, spaces there and you were, were innovating in that space too would you say is there a personal evolution of yourself where you said you you kind of you started in the hardware and then you went a certain route or so or was it more randomly happening these developments that's a great question so so the choice of companies uh, tended to be uh, what was the most technically challenging thing at the time i was a a technically challenging thing b that i was interested in um, and see, uh, usually if they were an underdog rather than the market leader, um, those kind of appeal to me because again, that uh, usually underdogs were a little more chaotic and also offered a little more opportunity. And, and I can't tell you those were at the time exquisitely conscious choices, but they ended up in hindsight to be a real pattern. Um, you know, if they were the market leader, they really didn't need crazy things going on or, you know, they had models that they followed that were successful. Um, and, and if they were kind of old industries, it's like I didn't think I was going to learn anything new, nor could I add any value. Again, pretty unconsciously, but it, it turns out that was a pattern. Um, and as you pointed out, I did go from types of company to types of company. In fact, I would never have said I was a semiconductor guy, but the only type of company I ever did twice was a chip with microprocessors. Um, but, but no, it wasn't from hardware to software. It was just going from different industries and experiences to the time. Um, you know, my last company, which I retired on, was an enterprise software company. We essentially invented uh, CRM, Customer Relationship Management. Tom Siebel did a much better job in actually naming it and executing it. But, but you know, we were essentially first. I didn't know a thing about enterprise software. I didn't even know what it, I didn't even know it was a thing until my co-founder Ben Wegwright walked in one day to, after I had just created my previous company, a game company, and told me about it. And I said, nah, that's a stupid idea. And of course, everything that Ben had told me through my entire career, it took me about a week to understand. And the more I thought about it, I thought, oh, this, this might be fun. And so I learned about enterprise software. And for a while, we actually changed that entire market segment. And and when a company went public, it had a eight billion dollar market cap, and and you know while it was part of an internet bubble, we had 125 million dollars in revenue when we went public, and from zero to 
to 125 million in three years. But, but to answer your question, no, there was no hardware to software pattern. It was uh, the pattern though <clears throat> that really was implicit in, in, in kind of the education of Steve Blank was actually uh, learning that there was uh, methodologies even in my own profession as a marketeer. Um, and, and instead of, you know, just blindly writing data sheets or, you know, trying to do competitive analysis or doing marketing communications, you know, as I got older and more experienced, I started to learn about, you know, like what's the role of marketing? Um, and, and I guess if I would have went to business school, I might have at least had some official definition, but I had to learn them ab initio from first principles myself. And I'd say about startup six or so, you know, I started learning like, oh, marketing, at least in, in one company, which was a consumer uh, electronics company, had three purposes. One is create end user demand and drive it into our channel, um, sales channel. B, educate the channel about why, and customers, why our products were better or superior, or et cetera. And then help engineering, understand customers' needs and desires and for future products and feedback on current ones. And then that became pretty simple. If you're not working on any of that stuff, you know, like stop working on it, you know, here's the three things you need to do. Um, and to that, and, and you know, and the corollary is, is that marketing's job is to make the VP of sales, the richest person in the company. Because if you're not doing that, you're not aligned to, to uh, mission. And then the other part was mission and intent. That is, on top of all the things you're supposed to be doing, what's the mission of the company? And, and I don't mean the PR mission, what's the, you know, is the company goal to make $100 million in revenue this year with 25% gross profit? Well, how does that translate to marketing's role in doing that? Do we need to generate, you know, 100,000 leads with, you know, uh, you know, 5,000 qualified ones into the sales force or drive people to X or Y or when marketing reviews and then those translated to departmental reviews. People were always confused about what's your job versus what does your business card say? You know, oh, the business card says I'm head of PR. I guess that means I answer the phone. No, it doesn't. Your, your job is to drive and use your demand or do something. Um, so I use that as one point in time to say, I didn't understand any of that when, when my career first started. And over time, I evolved to, I'd say, a pretty good marketeer. In fact, you know, I was a, I was a pretty rapacious uh, marketeer, um, maybe out of desperation. I remember, in fact, the company I was just talking about, um, we had just had our, uh, our second child. And my wife turns to me and says, uh, you know, we only have $15,000 left in the bank. I, I, I hope there's an IPO coming up. <laughs> I went, <"Wah!" laughs> and, and all of a sudden I got very motivated and we went from 11 to 68% market share in two and a half years and took the darn thing public out of chapter 11, which is out of bankruptcy. Um, Amazing which, turnaround that no? Yeah. yeah. So it was a, so it, it was a very, I guess I was a very hands-on street fighting marketeer learning from first principles. Um, and Lean came out of that, by the way, that the, the whole methodology came out of an experience I had in one of my companies. Um, and I still remember this till today. Um, it was, we were building a supercomputer company, a, a, a machine that uh, did uh, something called vector processing, worked on very high performance uh, applications at the time that um, needed very special purpose architectures. And ironically, those architectures are now used in graphics chips, but, um, but back then they, and we were attaching a graphics uh, system to it as well. It turned out to actually be the null set of what people were interested in, but, but we thought it was a good idea at the time. And we were having a planning meeting about you know, what features needed to be in the machine. And I was one of the co-founders of VP of marketing. And, and um, there was a really serious experienced people in the room. And uh, I mean, who've done this for 15 or 20 years. And we're sitting in this meeting and, and I'm a hot VP of marketing and I haven't heard the sound of my own voice in at least a half hour. So, you know, we're thinking about what features and I thought I ought to pipe up and, and throw in my two cents. And I remember saying, well, I think we needed a alpha channel and 24 bits of 
color graphics, which now today your iPhone has, but back then it was pretty expensive to do. And the CEO who was known to be literally a crazy guy, but successful, uh, and, but I had never reported to him before this company, I had worked in this company, um, looked at me and, and, and said, what did you say? And I said, oh, here's my opinion, more opinion, more opinion, marketing, marketing, marketing. <clears throat> and my friend, the John Rubenstein, who, who went off to much greater things at the time, was shaking his head going, don't, don't say that. <laughs> I talked about marketing and my opinion and the CEO put his face about three inches next to mine and started screaming at me. I mean, like, like you see in the movies with a drill sergeant and says, mm -hmm. you don't, you're an embarrassment to the role of marketing. You don't know a damn thing that you're and screaming. I mean, literally you could feel his breath on my face. You know, there's a room full of people here who spent 20 years in the industry and you're just spouting off, you know, BS, get the hell out of my company. And I felt this tall. I felt like I could walk out from underneath the closed door. I thought I had just been fired. And as I, he said, stand up and get, and I thought I was just being walked out of this company. And, and he said, and don't come back until you understand what customers really need and want. Customer discovery and customer development started that day with that lesson because he was absolutely right. And, and unless I had gotten hit on the head like that, some people <laughs> would have reacted differently. Um, trust me, I, I still remember the story vividly, but, but it really changed my career and I think changed all of Silicon Valley, maybe entrepreneurship that day. That said, essentially, there are no facts in the building. So get the hell outside. I was, I was just being, you know, your average stupid marketeer who thought their business card said you ought to have an opinion. It's a big idea. Your business card is meaningless. I don't care whether you went to Stanford or Harvard or any other school with an MBA. It doesn't really matter. I don't care. Tell me what customers want. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're inventing something new that never existed, then you can't ask them what they want, but you can ask and understand what's the day in the life of a customer today versus what do you imagine it to be when the world changes and what else needs to change to have that happen. So, so this notion of customer development and customer discovery started with a, you know, a pretty painful experience that luckily I kind of grew up in, a, in an environment where that was, if not the norm, not an unexpected. And it took me a while to recover from it. But as I said, I started practicing that from every company after that. And so by the time I retired, this whole get out of the building and talk to customers was an integral part of what made me back then just a great marketeer as I had competitors who were making it up while I was actually out and having my entire department practice this. And we were unbeatable um, when we had that skill set. Mm -hmm. What, what signals would you look for? No, as oftentimes founders have their ideas, many people out there have ideas where they kind of, they have a secure job here, they, they're well paid. Um, at the same time, they're working on this project and they wonder, should I really go all in? You said, no, it's so important to go out of the building. What kind of signals would you look for to say, no, that's a good signal to quit your well-paying job and actually go out and make it real? Well, you know, that's a great question. And, it, and, and though today the answer is a little easier, but I'll, I'll tell you in the 20th century, the first thing I, I would have suggested was look outside your window and, and are there other entrepreneurs and are you in an, in an entrepreneurial cluster? That is, are you in an ecosystem that supports entrepreneurs? That is, it's very easy to say in a Silicon Valley, even then, go quit your job. You could, you know, raise money and, and start, start something. But that was a pretty unique place in time in the 20th century. Um, entrepreneurship was not everywhere. It was only in isolated clusters. And more importantly, the culture of quitting your job and starting something new was pretty well understood in, a, in just a few places. Other places you were thought of as crazy people who couldn't hold a job and you shamed your family or community and couldn't raise money. So I'm now going to answer your question that says, fast forward to today, entrepreneurship is everywhere. Um, you know, the internet has made entrepreneurial knowledge, not just geography specific, but it, it's a keystroke away. In fact, the biggest problem for entrepreneurs is 
whose advice should I follow online? And there's infinite advice. Hard to imagine that did not exist. I mean, there was no entrepreneurial advice at all. There were not even entrepreneurial books. If you want to get books on innovation, it was about corporate innovation, nothing about early stage ventures. And number two is this culture of, of starting something new was also kind of crazy. You didn't do that. You, you know, smart people were told by their parents and by their mentors is you work for a large company or the government. Um, and that's a great career. Nowadays, it's understood anywhere from, from Silicon Valley to Mongolia to, you know, Estonia to what was especially Estonia to, you know, every place in Europe. Um, even France, you know, uh, uh, that, hey, this, this startup thing is kind of good. So the culture. It's, it's hit. No, yeah, it's very, yeah, people want to do it. But then as well, no, many people, they kind of say, okay, I, it, it feels so attractive. But as well, at the same time, I know, hey, there's a crazy failure rate in startups that say 80% of the ventures fail or more. Yeah. So I don't uh, want to be part of the failures. Like my resume looks so nice. I have like this yeah. great education. So, no, so I'm, I'm going to give you a... Um, a great way to think about it, and your listeners a great way to think about it. Founders, not early employees, but founders are closer to artists than any other profession. It's a big idea. Artists see things that other people don't, or they hear things that other people don't. Um, and they're passionate about creation of stuff. And artists don't create one thing. They create multiple things that most of them will fail, but it's their passion and their vision and their, their, their drive to, to kind of get this out of them that powers them through the inevitable failures that they will go through in spite of what everybody else says. Um, and, and so people confuse a founder with a job like, oh, you know, an accountant or a lawyer or, or just an engineer. That's a mistake. Um, founders are artists, and just like artists, um, there aren't many of them. I mean, yeah, I could maybe make a circle or whatever, but there's no way, you know, and there's no way I would want to do that. And so if you really think about it, founding a company is a calling, not a job. And this distinction between a job and a calling is pretty important. You know, I, I, every year, in at least when I teach in, in business schools, I get one or two students coming up with me, to me with almost exactly the same question. And it goes like this, Professor Blank, uh, we could really use your advice. Uh, I, I, I just got the, these two great offers and I don't know how to choose. Well, what are they? And, and the first one is almost always, I got this great offer from McKinsey. And I'm thinking about, and you go, McKinsey, <laughs> wow, that's you know, one of the world's best consulting firms. I'm like, that's a great job. Yeah. What's your other choice? Well, me and some friends in the dorm are thinking about a startup and let me tell you all about, and I go, stop, you've already decided. Well, no, let me tell you about the startup. I said, no, you don't understand. There's no possible way you could have the name McKinsey and startup in the same head and think there are equivalent opportunities. You should go to work for McKinsey. Because until one day you get up in the morning and you can't get the idea of the startup out of your head, even when you're driving home, that's when you ought to do a startup. But, it, but the problem nowadays is the word startup has become cool and whatever. It's like, oh, it'd be cool to kind of dress in black and become a painter or, you know, performance <laughs> artist or whatever. Yeah, it's kind of cool. But, you know, if you're not called for it, you won't last through all the chaos and uncertainty and failures and disappointments and whatever, startups are a miserable job. It's the world's worst job, but it's a great calling. Does, does that help? Yeah, I can see that. No, you have to have that inner voice that really deep yes. desire to about oftentimes you no know, specific things that you just want to build or change or whatever you know, yes. that really drives you. Having said that, no, like one big problem is uh, as well with passion. And so is passion could lead you as well into a direction where it just, it doesn't work, right? Yes. Where you're, you're very passionate, you feel this really strong emotional state of, hey, I want to do this. But there as well, oftentimes many people want to do exactly the same thing. And it has been tried many four times before and it's just, it does not work, right? So how can you figure out whether that passion that you really care about and that reality that you want to create is actually one that could could 
be real or whether it's just a hit, you know an imagination or so of things and and and, and it might not work well, wouldn't it be great if there was actually some methodology to allow you to test some of your hypotheses that <laughs> whether any of these were true? Well, you know, they're for the lean startup. And, and that's really a funny yin yang thing is here I am talking about, you know, that founders are artists and it's passion driven and it's a calling and whatever, yet okay. help build this process, which is pretty analytical in a scientific method. Absolutely. It seems like the opposite my kind of mindset, right? The artist like, no, now we're talking yeah. about numbers and metrics and KPIs. That's not for me, you know? And so I want to go back to, you know, great people have added huge value to, to what's become lean. But I want to remind everybody about what my motivation was. My motivation was to inform the founder's vision, not set up a giant focus group. That's a big idea and a big distinction, at least how I see lean. Mm -hmm. So lean is, I have this vision, I have this passion, <clears throat> and sure, let's go out and spend 20 years doing it. Well, that's great, but you know what? What if I could tell you whether this painting is gonna sell? Well, some people might go, I don't care, I just wanna paint, it doesn't matter, I don't care if I ever sell a thing. Great, but you know what? <laughs> I'm not renting you a, a loft because you won't be able to pay the rent. But there are some other artists who might say, yeah, I'm going to paint my passion and th this is the type of paintings I want to make. But really, if I actually, you know, test some art galleries, I could actually find out whether I could be buying the building I'm in versus living in the basement. Yeah, maybe I'll get some data. And the lean methodology for me, customer development was, if you remember that first story, was simply how to get informed about are, your, are you hallucinating or are you a visionary? It's a big distinction. Everybody starts with that passion, but is there some early signals I could get? And it turns out in business for existing markets, not new markets, but for existing markets, this is a no brainer. It's really easy. Is if you're making an existing market is, you know, if you show something to a customer or a potential customer, will they say, oh, that's the so-and-so market. And you know, is it faster or is it cheaper? Or is it better? They will actually tell you what the basis of competition is. And, and very quickly you can learn about what you need to do to sell them this better version. Or you could even get informed about, yeah, there's a general purpose product out there, but they really have niche needs. They were, you know, they're interested in a little price. Very quickly, you could find that out. Again, the painting analogy is like, oh, people are interested in X or Y. Just going uh, there, trying to sell it, see what they say kind of thing, no? Testing a series of, of hypotheses that make up a business, and we'll describe those in a second. In a new market, it's a little harder. In fact, it's a lot harder. If you ask the same questions in a new market, people are going to go, 20% cheaper than what? I don't even understand what this thing is. And, and, but, but still, there's huge value of getting out of the building. It's just that the questions are different and it requires a lot more insight and a lot more broader understanding of the ecosystem. And it is more of a guerrilla warfare, long-term play than a short-term play. But back to your point you just made, you know, getting out of the building, the question is test what? And it wasn't until Alexander Osterwalder came out with what was called the business model canvas that we had the third piece of what became lean. The first one was customer development. My contribution, Eric Reese's observation about, well, Steve, in the 21st century, no one uses waterfall engineering. We use agile engineering. That became piece two. And then when Osterwalder came out with a canvas, which was originally designed for a large corporate strategy, I recognized it was perfect for early stage ventures to say, well, what is it we need to be asking about outside the building? And then the canvas for most of your listeners might know is simply a single piece of paper with nine boxes on it that says, huh, who are the customers? Great customer segments. Two, what's the value proposition, which is really a fancy word for what product or service are you building for them? Huh. And by the way, those two things, um, customers and, and value proposition have a special name because when you find that fit, it's called product market fit. And that's what most startups search for on day one. But the other seven boxes are equally important. You know, how are you going to customer relationships? At least for startups, that's defined as how do you get customers, keep them and eventually grow them? 
And then channel, what kind of distribution channel? Is it an app store? Is it direct sales? Is it through multi-level distribution? What's the revenue model? And then pricing tactic underneath. And then what are the strategic activities that your company needs to be expert on? You know, manufacturing or software or, or medical device. And then what type of resources do you need to own inside versus what kind of partners can provide those instead of you having to hire or build your own manufacturing plant? Can you get it made in China? And then what are the costs? And so now we have a, so what am I supposed to do outside the building? You're supposed to write down all these hypotheses on day one and go validate them. And then two more things come out of that is, well, because of Reese's observation about agile engineering, we don't need to go through the traditional waterfall model of alpha test, beta test, first customer ship, and then finally ship and find out the product's wrong. We could build products incrementally and iteratively in such a way that we, as we're going out of the building testing our hypotheses, we could be also testing what are called minimum viable products. Um, and that's products. really a misnomer because yes, the first MVPs you want to test are about the product itself, but you want to test pricing. You want to test, is this the right channel? You want to test, you know, um, you want to test position. demand creation, AB testing. You want to test all these things. So MVPs are not just about the product. And then probably the most powerful thing about the whole lean method and, and people, who hear this are kind of just incredulous. In the 20th century, um, once you raised money and gave investors your five-year plan, that plan was inviolate, meaning you could not change it. In fact, the only way we would change a plan was when we fired an executive. And it typically fired an executive is we would go through a year or two of development, ship the product, you know, sales don't match the forecast, they first fire the VP of sales, then they fire the VP of marketing, then they fire the CEO. And each one of those firings was essentially what we now call a pivot because the new person would come in and change the plan or the strategy. But for me, a pivot is really kind of interesting. Once we have data from outside the building, either based on interviews or reactions to MVPs or trying to get early orders based on MVPs, a pivot is defined as a change to more of those business model canvas components. That is, we discovered that like, we got the right product, but the wrong customer segment. Or these customers love this, but they actually love features three, 12 and 15. Let's stop working on the other ones because the people don't really care about those. We're, or we have now given our mission to kind of buy and rapidly change before we run into this fix we had. In hindsight, what we were doing in the 20th century is assuming that founders and investors could predict the future. And that was a mistake. Mm. You can't. Um, when so you so that, that, that was the lean startup. And, and that's, uh, and, you know, that's practiced now by at least, at least lip surface now by most <laughs> of the entrepreneurs in the world. Absolutely. <laughs> Some people actually practice. It has yeah. become, I would say, so big that if you ask the average founder here on the street, let's say in Europe, are you doing lean startup? Like everybody's doing lean startup. For them, though, however, it means I'm starting a company without money. So I guess I'm a lean entrepreneur, which has virtually right. like very little to do oftentimes with you know, yeah. the lean startup. Where do you see like core applications for people you know, that, let's say, do you read uh, your books, the one from Eric Ries, the Osterwalder ones? Where do you see the main application mistakes where you say, hey, this is what typically people get wrong. That's not our message or my message especially. Um, watch out for this, but you know, do that instead. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you really think about everything I said, there's no math involved. <laughs> so technically, it's not very hard. It's emotionally hard uh, because it, in fact, runs against <clears throat> exactly what we've been describing is that startups are done by founders with passion and vision. And, you know, what do you mean I need some facts? Get the hell out of my way. I'm the founder. Here's what we're going to go build. You guys start coding or, you know, and, and by the way, starting coding is fine. It's just, you know, don't get any input is bad. Um, and that's a real conundrum for founders who have, particularly first time founders who've never failed before, think, well, it, yeah, that's nice, but I, I know what we should do. Um, 
And so the biggest problem in, in, um, on one side are founders who believe that's nice, but you know, my vision is right. I'm Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, and I really don't need to get out of the building. And, and we, we could talk about that mythology as well, but you know, that's kind of, that's failure mode one. Failure mode two is equally investors who go, yeah, 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 that's nice, but that takes time. Just build the damn thing, you know? And by the way, that might work for them because unlike you, who, where your portfolio of companies is one, they have a portfolio of companies of 10 or 15 or more where they could tell all of them to swing for the fences and don't bother testing anything. I don't think that's an efficient path, but maybe. Um, but, but it's very different. They're, they're running very different math than you are. Um, and then the third failure mode is, oh, I spoke to five people. Five people yesterday? No, 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 I spoke to five people. <laughs> well, even my students talk to 10 to 15 people a week. You know, over 10 weeks, they're talking to hundreds of, of potential customers. Um, so so <clears throat> unless you have some good data set coverage of the business model canvas, if you're only gonna do five people or 10 people, don't even bother. Uh, this really requires a kind of a method and, and, a, and a regular um, a tempo and speed of doing this. Um, even when I was telling you that story about that marketing department where I kind of figured out the roles, um, everybody in the marketing department to attend my staff meeting had to talk to two customers a week. And I had 14 people at, at one point. And so think about it. I had a marketing department talking to 25 customers a week. You know, multiply that by 50 weeks. I was talking to over a thousand customers, you know, a year. My competitors might be talking to 10. Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden, I had to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to have a huge competitive advantage because I had this data feed. And more importantly, it trained my entire marketing department to stop arguing with each other about what was important, that now the conversations were about, did we understand customer needs and were we confusing today's needs with tomorrow's needs, et cetera, but we at least had some real facts. Um, and we had a methodology to make that a continual process. Um, and by the way, if you didn't call two customers a week, you couldn't attend my staff meeting. And if you didn't under, uh, attend my staff meeting, you no longer worked for me. <laughs> so it was, a, it, was, it was a pretty pretty rigorous path. But it, again, when I talked about the company that went from 11 to 68% market share, that was the reason, um, is we stopped guessing and started doing something our competitors hadn't figured out. Which what would you suggest is like the best way to actually get in touch with the target customers? Because especially like B2C, then normally what we find is people sending around some questionnaires to some convenience group, their friends, hey, on WhatsApp, Facebook, whatever. No, hey, can you please respond to this? No, a kind of convenience sampling, I guess we would call it. Uh, otherwise, might focus on B2B customers, and but then they come back and say, well, we have problems actually meeting up with somebody because they're not responding. And so these days on LinkedIn, people get like a, a swamp, basically, they get too many emails coming in. What would you suggest in both cases, like B2C and maybe B2B? Like what's the most effective way then to actually get in touch with these people? Yeah, so um, I kind of have this uh, hierarchy of, uh, of the best kind of connections with people. Um, you know, the best, <clears throat> and I used to think, and, and now I'll modify it based on, on Zoom and, and video conferencing, I, I used to believe the best meetings were kind of one-on-one -on -one in person where you could see somebody's pupils dilate. That is, you could see their body language or whether they're looking at their watch or whether they're rolling their eyes. At, um, and then the next, you know, valid kind of uh, type of customer discovery was via video conferencing. I now kind of switched that around going, you could probably do 5X more customer discovery, the first level interviews via video, video conferencing than you can in person. And I would save the in-person meetings for second or third level, you know, follow-ups rather mm -hmm. than, uh, and so, so that's my pandemic learn, by the way. You know, the, the next one is uh, phone calls where you could at least hear somebody's uh, uh, voice and, and uh, and, and get some understanding of their interest. You don't know though if they're doing email or looking at their phone or something else. The third level down is maybe, um, you know, email or, or or online surveys. And then the you know the worst kind is which I used to use all the time, which is market research. 
and I have a joke that says, you know, you know, if, 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 if market researchers understood the future, they'd be running hedge funds, not working in market research funds, um, firms. And, and so there's kind of a taxonomy about the validity of customer uh, discovery data. And so I kind of separate, unless you've seen somebody's facial expressions, you really, really haven't gotten a lot of data. I mean, you've gotten some data, but it's, it's not as valid as, as having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. The, the second part of your question is, well, how do I get to those people? <laughs> And there's a whole art of doing that. You know, the, the classic is you send an email that says, I got your name from somebody, you know, name that they know who says you're the smartest person in this industry. And I want, I just want 10 minutes of your time and I'm not selling you anything. Oh, well, you just kind of eliminated, you know, one is they, you would told them they were the smartest person. Two is, you know, like you're not selling anything. And three, you just want 10 minutes, you know, no one's calendar has a section that short. I mean, 10 minutes, I could fit you in anywhere. Um, and then you pointed out LinkedIn and, and Zoom and whatever, uh, or LinkedIn and other networking tools allow you to do that. But I found at least during the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of the gatekeepers, admins and secretaries, et cetera, are not sitting in your, in your bedroom. So, so all of a sudden you get much more people uh, than, uh, than you normally could. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Now I'm, I'm just checking here, like the visual is somewhat blurry. My image, sorry for that. Just, uh, just I hope that it, it just must be some kind of autofocus function here. So sorry for that. Uh -huh. uh, great. So um, asking no, like in a way as well, in a positive way, not trying to sell somebody to get in touch for a short period of time. Uh, no, like these 10 minutes in between. Now we're online, we have these 10 minutes. How do I very efficiently get to the core information that I need in only 10 minutes? So, you know, um, uh, Oscar Walter, I'm a big fan of uh, everything he's written, has a new book out called Testing Business Ideas. Um, and, and there's a whole series of, uh, of exercises or things you could do for the different phases of customer discovery versus customer validation. You know, if you think about it, discovery is just simply, are my hypotheses right? Or am I even in the right ballpark? Is this the right feature or market or customer segment? Validation is simply, will they give me money or will they use the product? I mean, that's a very different step. Once you think you've got this right and people have been nodding and saying the right things or maybe, you know, pointing to your wireframe or something, now can I, what experiments do I run in the next phase? Um, just going through that book, I actually just kind of make it required reading for all the classes I teach. Um, it's a great handbook of, of almost every uh, tip and trick for, uh, for discovery and validation. Mm -hmm. Perfect, no, so we we'll reference that. One thing as well that we said, uh, no, to then go out, test these core hypotheses, try to map out all the core ones. Do that actually be, make that a habit, do that regularly every week, basically schedule your, your meetings there with the target customers. So we're out there, we're doing that. We still haven't closed any single sales. And, but people are telling us they keep meeting with us. What do we do? Like, uh, we have to pay some rent, you know, we have. <laughs> so, so a couple of things to recognize, and I keep going back to this. Um, it, it, it depends on what market you're in and what, what I call market type. You know, Clinton Christensen called it sustaining versus disruptive innovation. I call it existing market versus new market. If you're in an existing market and you haven't gotten any revenue or people, you know, writing you early orders, um, you haven't been listening to your data and you haven't been smacked. You haven't been paying attention to your own discovery or you've not wanted to believe what the data has been telling you. Um, because in an existing market, it's very simple. You know, either people want to grab it out of your hands because it's better and sufficiently better than what they have, or or it's not. And it's and you you need to pivot or shut it down. In the new market, that's different. And a new market, you know, it might be that people don't see it yet, or it's and and that you are a visionary. It's like SpaceX talking about reusable mm -hmm. rockets. But you know, every month every time is running against us, right? And we don't have much money left. Like, I'm, I don't know how to make ends meet and so how, how yeah, much time so, should I give myself? Yeah, so most startups fail. Um, 
<laughs> you know, and, and no one starts a company thinking they're going to fail, but most of them do. Um, but I have to tell you, if you're still having meetings where people saying it's nice, um, but you don't have any money, then you've fallen in love with hearing people say it's nice. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, even like if you were making an app that you were going to charge $10 for, people go, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's great. I can't wait till it comes out. Well, obviously, you didn't say, well, that's great. You could be one of the first people to use it. Uh, put $10 or 10 pounds in this envelope, and I'll seal the envelope, and I won't, uh, I won't spend the money, but I'd like you to open your wallet and give me $10 now. Well, I don't know. <laughs> All of a sudden, you realize that people were being polite to you, and you just didn't want to hear the bad news because you didn't ask for an order for an unfinished buggy product. And people, and people would go, well, who would pay for the buggy unfinished? Only people who think you have something worth buying. There's lots of stuff I would give people money for early on. Tesla you know, gets hundreds of millions of dollars of pre-orders for people going, yeah, put me on the list. Um, you know, you want to get put me on the list money. And, and if you think that can't be done, you know, I was getting million dollar orders, purchase orders for things where I just had slides for. Well, the purchase order said, you know, 100% refundable if we don't deliver every one of these features. It required a commitment in a corporation all the way up to the CFO and sometimes the CEO and board for something of that scale that was unfinished. But I tested whether it was so important and so strategic that if I delivered this, it was going to be a game changer. But also remove the risk that if I didn't deliver it, they didn't. They weren't at risk, so it was a win for both people. I had validation to engineering that said, "Build the damn thing." I got customers. Um, does that make sense? And you could do that from ten dollars to to a million dollars. And and I found most founders are sometimes hesitant to ask for money for something that's not complete, or ask for some kind of sign sign ups or put me on the list or whatever. Oh, I got 3 million people waiting for the product. Well, you know, that's probably a real commitment, no? Like putting as well the yeah. money where the mouth is and yeah. getting skin in the game on the customer yeah. side as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in terms of like the overall big picture, you've, you've seen a lot of ventures, right? Uh, you've created them, you've invested in them. For you personally speaking, now we have the uh, uh, low customer development, lean startup developing. Hopefully people know with as well with this interview with other resources, they you know, can read more, they can apply it more. Hopefully they make less and less mistakes in the customer space. What's another core space where you say, well, if I do my next development, it will not be customer development, it will not be product development, it will be X. Yeah, so my, my focus in the last couple of years, just because you know, I think Eric Ries and Osterwalder have done a great job kind of covering the startup world, has been focusing on large organizations, companies, and government agencies. Um, and they have much, much different problems. Um, you know, in a startup, 100% of the organization is focused on innovation, in at least new innovation, 100%. That's the, that's the rationale of the organization. In a company, it's maybe, you know, 0.05%. In a government agency, even less. And in a startup, think about it, you could do anything. You could even break the law, for God's sake. And, and if you think I'm joking, look at Airbnb and Tesla and whatever. They all, Uber, they all broke the law to, to create a new business model because they're investors. At least in the 21st century, no one in the 20th century would have invested in these things. But in the 21st century, investors got so greedy that said, they said, really? We could make $10 million? Yeah, you guys go break the law. Let us know what happened. Um, so today, you can't do that in a corporation. You know, you go to jail. Your CFO and you, as CEO, and probably your general counsel will all be in jail. Um, or be in, your company would be delisted or something else. And in a government agency, you're only allowed to do what the law says you're supposed to do. You can't even do other things. So, so, so in large organizations, there are these constraints on, on innovation in a way that's uh, not even obvious. Um, but the problem is, and this really turned into a problem in 2013, the Harvard Business Review, kind of the gold standard for, for managers and corporations, put it on its cover, why the lean startup changes everything. And so for the last seven years, we've created a whole set of what I'll call innovation theater, 
inside of corporations and government agencies, not because people were dumb. People wanted to move fast, but realized that they have, didn't realize they created kind of a cargo cult. They, they copied the, 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 the externalities of what innovation looks like. The but buzzwords didn't, and so on, oh yeah. But didn't understand that, that really, you know, uh, uh, the distinction between a startup and a large corporation is, you know, uh, large companies execute known business models. Startups search for them. But, but so startups aren't smaller versions of large companies, but we're discovering large companies aren't bigger versions of startups. And here's why, is that to get large, you've developed a whole set of processes and, and procedures and OKRs and KPIs um, that are great. I mean, they're not like horrible. They're, that's what, why you're able to scale is you don't need crazy, brilliant people in every job just having average people because there's a process, there's a handbook, there's a 400 page HR manual, and, you know, the finance, you know, rule book and when you can spend money and how. The problem is, is that strangles innovation. It's a big idea. Process, procedure, OKRs, KPIs, organization charts, whatever, kills innovations in government agencies and, 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 uh, and large corporations. <laughs> and I'm coming to realize that what we don't need first is incubators and accelerators in large companies. What, what we've seen is you stand those up and they have nice posters and coffee cups and lanyards and you can have dogs and beanbag chairs. But then you go ask, so what happens to the output of those, those innovations? What happens to those teams? And then people kind of look at their shoes and shuffle their feet and whatever. And, and when you do diagnostics, you, you find out that Really, what we should have done first is actually to create a parallel organization that has their own processes and procedures and, and ability to kind of bypass the existing processes. It's how the Mac got built, right? It, it stood outside. It's how Lockheed Skunk works. I mean, there's a lot of history that says it's not that the company procedures are wrong. They're just wrong for rapid innovation what we have right now in large companies and government agencies are large, uh, rapid demos, but not rapid deployment. <laughs> um, and so what I'm trying to teach is that we need to work on the hard stuff as well, which is what kind of organizational design do we need to run innovation and, and uh, execution in parallel? And about 30 years ago, um, Tushman and O'Reilly talked about this. They called it the ambidextrous organization, fancy word for being able to do execution and innovation um, simultaneously. But in the 20th century, and that was a nice to have. In the 21st century, I believe it's critical to have. You, unless you start building that type of organization, your, your company is probably not long for this, for the CERT. Mm -hmm. So I don't even remember the question you asked. <laughs> that was, <laughs> no, but I see like, you uh, know, the passion now for applying basically, you know, customer development methodology lean startup for more corporate context. And there you say it's, it's a different setup, right? It's yeah. cannot just uh, basically have people work in the small teams and then say hey, develop something when there's no overall structure, how later on this gets implemented to real products, right. how these get sold. Yeah, and worse, finance says you can't travel or you can't spend this money. And HR says, oh, no, you can't move the, the best people in here. You need the most senior people because they have seniority. Or I mean, all the rules that make sense for scale don't make sense for innovation. <clears throat> and, all, and the existing sales team says, no, that new product will put our existing stuff out of, you know, at ORG. That's a different channel. We'll have channel conflict. I mean, you could almost go through a checklist of every one of these things. But, but what they don't realize is your competitors don't have those constraints. They're going to eat your lunch because you, you are the ones tying your hands behind your back. So it would be about, you might want to think about separate organization where they haven't yet chance to build up a new basic organization from scratch, developing products, product market fit, and then scalable channels. So basically, no, is, is that there, correct? Yeah, that, that's one path. There are lots of alternate paths to do that. It starts though with, with something that's obvious, but rarely happens is leadership understanding that that's needed. It's a big idea, whether it's the managing directors or board of directors and exec staff need to agree, hey, <laughs> we're strangling innovation ourselves. We're gonna die if we don't change. 
if, if that doesn't happen on a senior level, instead what you hear is kind of words, innovation, innovation, without understanding. We have some budget, like some hundred thousand here for this, right. uh, half yeah. a million, million, whatever. That, yeah. This really requires some structural organizational changes that might be painful um, and it might create conflict and it might, and, and if you want to avoid that, then that's okay, but your stock is going to be a short-term stock because we hear the word disruption all the time, but what it really means is there are lots of external things now happening to companies that just didn't exist in the 20th century. Whoever thought that startups could raise more money than large companies could? I mean, that's just insane. That was an insane thought when I was an entrepreneur. It's, it happens every day now. You know, in the 20th century, large companies worried about other large companies. You know, uh, whoever thought startups would disrupt your entire business? The internet has changed the value of brands. Now you can create a brand within a year, you know, devaluing hundred year old brands. Yep. Um, you know, we could go through a whole list of rapid changes. The problem is, is we still have the same organizational structures we built in the early part of the 20th century um, mm -hmm. without recognizing that actually this, this disruptive activities are not going away. They're going to continue when they exist in every space now, every marketplace. So a strong uh, call you know, for entrepreneurs that want to make it real within existing organizations. You, know, you have more information as well on your blog, uh, not at steveblank.com, um, where they can read as well more on that. Maybe like final element on that piece, what I always wonder about is the question of equity, right? Like one big incentive and upside for the entrepreneur oftentimes is it's the core is we build a company that becomes very valuable and then maybe another big company buys us or we you know, have a listing on the stock market and there's a liquidity event there. So it's a personal game changer for the founders involved. It creates basically financial independence for them. To me, I wonder in this corporate setting, wouldn't really the strong entrepreneurial minded people then just leave the corporation, start their own venture and basically get a sub substantial significant chunk of equity instead of having to deal with all this corporate mess? Yeah, that assumes that 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 is a logical set of assumptions. It turns out it's not true. Um, it, there are some percentage of entrepreneurs and when they wake up, you know, get woke and go, what am I doing here and just leave um, for exactly the reasons you described, which is I'm in it for the money. There's a, I, I would suggest that the majority of them would in fact love to stay in their company because they realize the company has an incredible channel, great engineering talent, huge manufacturing assets, etc. But the thing that's killing them is that they're trying to operate innovation inside of an execution model. That if in fact, if you could release all those barriers and create a parallel process that allowed you access to the resources of the large company, but allowed you to act as innovators, you find the majority of them would actually stay and turn their company into this killer machine. And by the way, and after they succeed, they'll realize they could do this outside, but at least you get at least, seriously, one or two cycles for them. Most entrepreneurs don't leave large companies for their money. I, uh, I, I will guarantee you that's a fact they leave is because they're being strangled by the existing execution processes and they're tired of beating their heads against the wall. If, the, if that's my experience, okay. obviously uh, all the, the smart ones after doing this, even after their success inside, more of them will decide, well, I'm good at this. I'll leave. But in the meantime, companies could get this cycle that they're just missing um, because they don't have a parallel process that they haven't done the right organizational design. Should they incentivize these people in any way? Or are you saying it's no, not needed? No. Uh, so, so that's the mistake that large companies make is that they do all the easy stuff first. Let's set up the accelerator. Oh, it's, it's, we're losing entrepreneurs. It must be because we're not paying them enough. Oh, you know, yes, but you're not really dealing with the core issue. The core issue is every, every process and procedure you have in place trying to apply it to the entrepreneurs. There is no organizational home for them when they leave that accelerator and they have to go back into their existing organizations rather than, no, 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 we have an innovation funnel that operates in parallel and it has its own financial rules, its own HR rules, its own channel or whatever. Now, all of a sudden, we've decided to have those fights at the exec staff level that we should have had on day one because these require 
different models for how to operate the organization and they will create conflict. And if you want to avoid conflict, then you will lose your entrepreneurs. Um, I think we've now run this experiment for you know five or seven years and, and have seen that's the case, that the companies that succeed are the ones who actually uh, understand that, that it's the innovators that are gonna innovate at the edge that will eventually become the core. Uh, and, and as it starts at the edge, you know, it will create more and more conflict as it replaces the you know, existing models. And, and yeah, there will be channel conflict because your old channel will be obsolete by the time the innovation becomes the new standard. And it happens all the time. It's this classic uh, you know, creative destruction going on inside of a company. And, and if you think about it, if you, don't, if you don't execute your own creative destruction internally, it's gonna happen to you from external forces. Somebody will do that. Steve, I can see how you're so passionate now about helping the uh, big corporations as well, becoming a bit, you know, quite a bit more entrepreneurial and innovative. And so for you, like your personal goal, let's say for the next couple of years, what would make you super happy, super exciting? To be able to wake up every morning. <laughs> so that well, one I assume as given, what else? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've been retired over 20 years now. And so, so the nice part of my definition of retirement is to be able to work on whatever's interesting to you, number one, and, and make a contribution to, you know, God, country, community, family, et cetera, and try to make the world a better place. Um, and so I've done things in multiple areas. And, you know, obviously in innovation entrepreneurship, I've been trying to help uh, governments uh, um, kind of innovate as well. I, I, my other interests are in conservation and, and the environment. And uh, um, and so, it, you know, I've been doing multiple things that, that I think push the ball forward and, and raise us all up. Um, you know, I, I, as I said, I, I, I think the goal is when you're, you know, we're only here for a short period of time. And, and when you look back, you want to say, did you make a dent and, and, uh, and make the world better? Um, so that's my goal. Um, and as long as I'm able to do that, and, and I find it interesting, and there's a lot of interesting stuff out there, um, it, it's, it's fun. So Wonderful. We can totally see you doing that, making a dent in this world, and very excited to see you on to the next projects, what you'll do to build this further out. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, sharing all these insights for the people that want to make it real and want to start their own ventures. Thanks so much, and all the best going forward. Thank you for having me. Take care.